Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Biology. What's your BSA score? The Biology Skill Assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the NIA and NJCAA to discover and develop the best talent for your team. This 10 minute, 100 shot test can be taken for free today on the Biology mobile app. Elevate your game. I think a big, not argument, but there, there might be a divide with some coaches is it's my system and I will fit any player that I get into that system or I'm going to fit our system depending on the players or I'm going to shape our system depending on the players. But where do you uh, line up on that side? Is it system or is it players? Um, it's players, 100%. And, you know, like, you know, I've been at um, several jobs in my career and like my the job I'm at now. Next year will be my sixth year. And I think we've played two or three different styles of play in that amount of time. And people say, well, that's crazy. But I don't think it is. Our standard is play hard. Our standard is do your job. Our standard is be a great teammate. Our st- so we have our standard. But it, you know what? If I want to go back to the matchup zone and lead pressure man-to-man, big deal. I mean, truly big deal. We can. Our guys have done it. You know, um, if we want to slow it down instead of play fast next year, slow it down a little. I'm saying like, I think we get so lost in this stuff that unless you can recruit your own kids, yeah, give me a break talking right. about your system. Because let's say you're a running gun, get out, um, you know, fire like we were last year. We tried to play really, really fast, and it was good for us. Um, but let's say you get, you know, I get a, a 6'11 kid in who he's not going to be running the floor as fast. What, like I'm probably going to run more stuff around him, probably slow it down. Or what if you get – you know, you may coach, um, you, you have, I know, I know coaches who have struggled to get 10 kids on their team. Yeah. I know coaches who play with six and have maybe eight kids in the program, but what's your style of play going to be? You know, so, you know, I, I've wrestled with this, but I just know, I look at, I look at our schedule. I look at, our, I look at our competition. I look at our league and our league's changing. Um, we're going to much tougher league from top to bottom. And I think we'll go back to uh, – we'll still have our man-to-man and our pressure and things like that, but I think we'll do a lot more zone. Yeah. You know, I don't, and I don't think that – and I've got the exact same kids. I had no seniors last year. So I had no seniors. So I'm keeping the exact same kids. I'm going to just tweak the system. I think we can keep a lot of the aspects of it. But, but again, I think, it's a, I think it's tough for a high school coach that is at the mercy of who lives in your district. Yeah. And, and again – I know coaches are schools of 2,000 people. They can find those kids in that school to fit their system. My, my school's got 400 kids. You know, yeah, let's our say we got, schools are very similar with yeah, that. Yeah, we, we have 200 boys and about 20 to 25 play basketball. Um, so, yeah, I'm a, I, I like to fit things on the players, you know. But, you know, I think that – I don't think that you could just say I want to be the style of play and then what if you get kids in there that it's not the best fit for them. Or you're trying to like push a square hole, a yep. square in a circle, and I, I just don't know. I just don't think it works. I think you have your standards of how you want to play, but if I want to be a zone guy, a matchup zone guy, or a man-to-man guy, or a press guy, it's, it's irrelevant. It's still going to be amongst our style of play and our and our our standard of how we play is not going to change. Man, I think I just think you're right on the money, and you said something really uh, that I like is it's your standards can stay the same, but be yeah. willing to adjust in areas that will help your players be successful on the floor. I, I when I came to Faith, this is my ninth year here. I inherited a, a senior heavy team that had played slow the year before, but they were athletic. They had some shooters, and so when mm-hmm. I came in with a running and gunning style, we went from averaging fifty points a game to eighty-two. Like they just they just adopted it in mm-hmm. a great way. And as a, that was my first year as a head coach, I made the mistake of thinking it's my system that did it right and the next year's team we went 14 and 21 
trying to run the exact same system against yeah. the exact same schedule, but with yeah. way different players. And and unfortunately, so maybe players or coaches can learn from you know my mistake and and others' mistakes of uh, I had to learn that lesson with a couple difficult seasons before stepping back and saying it's not about me. It's not about my style. It's how can I help this group of players that 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 I've been given uh, make it work. Now I'm with you. Like my first year at this job, I inherited my first year. I think there were nine or eight seniors on the team, and we had good wingspan, really good wingspan, big guys. We played uh, pack line. The next three years, we went uh, with a one-one-three matchup, which I love it. I love it. And last year we were a pressure, pressing a ton, subbing, playing 10 and 12 guys and all that. And, but, you know, we're bumping up two classifications. Um, and I feel like part of me thinks we, we're going to go back to the zone. You know, I'm, I'm not committed to it right now, but the more I, I think about the success we had and I also look at the league too. You know, a couple of years ago, every single team in our league was running dribble drive. Well, if I want to run dribble drive or race in space or whatever we want to call it with well, generically the same thing, double, triple gap style basketball. Yep. Well, I don't know if, if I do what everyone and everybody's like, well, just do it better. Well, I mean, I guess I don't know if I can do it better than the guys been doing it seven years. I don't know if I can just do it better. Well, your talent has to catapult you further. Yeah. yeah. Right. So whenever we saw like, okay, it's it's a uh, pretty much four out one in. We went to a lot of like uh, chin and and point series and some you know just some Princeton style stuff. You know I know Princeton's a term, term people use loosely, um, and that gave us a lot of success because I mean if you see dribble drive every single night from our seven teams in the league, well then you don't ever have to prep for me. You prep for one team. You prep for every team. Truly, so at least we gave them something else. Everyone was playing man, so we went to the zone. So at least when you saw us come in. It was just being just a little different style of play, you know. But yeah. see, now we'll have our man system in from last year, and the guys who a couple years ago, we we know the zone. So I think we'll even be better because we can, you know, we can do either either defensive style and offensively. Obviously, my offensive style, um, you know, just based on where my scores are. Do I have a dominant big like I've had in the past? Do I have a lot of shooters? Do I have guys who can get downhill? You know, you know, I just kind of go with what I have, and obviously, you want to develop those players' strengths. Yeah, I just wonder how many times uh, coaches are handcuffed because they're just, like you had mentioned, just trying to fit, you know, uh, that that square peg into a round hole, and and the level of maturity that it takes though to to go into. And I had I had one coach on here from this area. Uh, he, he coaches at Dallas Jesuit, and he 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 made a great comment of every year I start fresh. Yeah. The idea of even if you got players coming back like you do next year, not saying, well, it worked then, we have to do it the same way now. Yeah. Maybe you start fresh like you're talking about. And I think you've got to be realistic, too, about how many of your players are playing two and three sports. Yeah. If if 80% of your guys play football, it will make you a bigger, stronger, tougher team, but you're not going to see them a lot in the summer. So you also have a system that is built around uh, legit, you know, realistic time expectations with your players and all right okay my football guys are going to miss the first three weeks of the season i need something we can install in the summer and they can also pick up relatively quick because they're we've missed two or three games you know a lot of my coaching buddies don't get their football guys till early december and they've started playing games well before thanksgiving and so or you could argue you need the you need a consistent system every year so they can just roll into it easily yeah, so i see that but I guess it depends on in, in your state, how much time do you get in the summer? You know, all that type of stuff, I think. Uh, what can you do in the preseason? So, you know, I think you got to be realistic with what you want to install with the time allowed if you want your players to, you know, do it well. Because if you if you want to keep switching stuff up too, too much, I would say it's hard to change the offensive and the defensive system, right? You know, you want to pick one. Yeah, a complete overhaul. Might right. just, you might end up not being very good at anything. Yeah, so like if you've been man-to-man -man for five years, you want to go zone. Which can, I don't think that's a big change, though. Like people act like it's the hardest thing in the world. I really don't. If you've got a good man-to-man -man system established. Principles. Principles are the same. I think it's, I think it's same. easy yeah. 
yeah. easier to go uh, zone. But I, but if you're going to change offensive stuff completely, I think that's a little harder because obviously that's more of a skill, just a more skill based uh, yeah. offensive as opposed to like I can make I can make the the kid who can't score a point they can become a great defensive player, right? So you know, but I'm about to go back to the beginning. I'm about you know players over over style of play. Do you guys, you guys have a shot clock where you're at? We do. We started it last year. How it's that, thirty-five. It you know, it's thirty-five seconds, which is an eternity. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. There were games we forgot it was even there. Yeah. I mean, truly, uh, we saw maybe three shot clock violations all year. Um, but most games, you know, we were playing at such a pace, and the teams we play are such, such a good pace. Um, you know, it really came into play. Um, I think that. There were some times where if a team was a zone team, obviously you ha- they they weren't going to be forced to come out of their zone, which I right. think was good. So, yeah, I think it was good for the game, but I think if they truly wanted to impact the game more, they should have made it 30 seconds. I mean, 35 is a long time. I mean, very rarely are you going to run offense for 35 seconds. Yeah, that's a good I point. I mean, you know, I think they should have gone 35. They really want to – play the rest of the world go 24. I'm not saying I want 24, but what was the reason for the shot clock? You know, a lot of my Georgia peers would disagree with me. So here's my thoughts on it. It cost $3,000 to put in, 3,100 to put in roughly. We've got 400 schools. So we spend like 1.5 million for it to come into play three possessions all year. I just don't know if we really thought about it. And a lot of the teams pushing for the shot clock are these high level six A seven A schools? They they won't see a shot clock violation. Yeah, in five they years just didn't want those few dudes that are willing to hold it for a whole quarter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if but look, if you're a high level team, ain't nobody holding the ball. Against That's right. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, really, pe- teams want to hold the ball, which I'm not against. But I've done, I've done it. And I think at a girls game one year, we won. It wasn't. It was like twenty. <laughs> It's like 23-17. Now, that wasn't the lowest score in the world to run a lot of offense, but 40 total points were scored. But I don't think we would have won the game any other way in hindsight. Um, But I think, you know, if I allow a team to hold the ball against me for a quarter and I just won't leave my zone, you better be just as mad as the defensive coach as the offensive coach. Yeah, there's always the two sides to that. Yeah, Right. And if you're really skilled, you're not holding the ball. I mean, I've seen seen these crazy examples where – it's a four to two at half, but I don't know if we want to make. I just don't know if making if that was your motive. You know, I just don't know if that's the right motive because high level kids play with a shot clock in the summer. Yeah, like AAU probably plays with a lower than thirty five second shot clock. Yeah, you know, and I'm not I'm not against it. I think I think it's you know fine for the game, but I think we should have made it thirty seconds to yeah, really. I, I don't think we should ever get into making decisions because of the what the rare things or the outliers, Yeah, you know, what, what happens all the time, which is both teams, you know, right in that 15 to 20 second range, you know, uh, if they're just playing with a normal pace and, and, and yeah, right. I, I don't, I don't think it's that big of a thing. Our one, one division of, of our high schools, SPC down here is going to, we don't have it, but they're going to adopt it next year at 30. And so they're yeah. kind of the Guinea pigs. Um, and, and I, I'm with you. I, I, I'm not, we, we've we've transitioned to a, a kind of a matchup three two zone that that's really worked well for us and our personnel the last few years and it's only been a few times where I felt like golly they they their their possessions are just so long now, yeah. we weren't we weren't forcing them to play uh, and we weren't creating any advantages for ourselves yeah but I I, I just I'm interested to see uh, how do you guys here here's a question for it how do you run it because that's been one talk of where I'm at a private school and we have parent volunteers that do yeah. clock and book anyway. That's another parent volunteer. How do you guys do it? Well, GHSA, our governing body, I'm in a public school here. I don't think the private schools here and their league, the GISA, I don't think they're adopting the shot clock. But for us, you could get a volunteer, they have to go through a class and you had to, you know, you could pay them whatever, or you could go through an official, you know, and pay them a little more. Yep. I went through the official for two reasons. One is I had multiple people who run it, wanted to run the shot clock. And so then you get in the thing where I'm telling one person yes, someone else no. We're having to pay them. 
And I also didn't want anybody with shot clock violations that happened, and they did happen occasionally. I mean, meaning the person at the clock made an error. They didn't yeah. reset it. They reset it. I didn't want anybody, you know, talking about like you know home cooking or, sure. or whatever. So I just figured let's get let's get a neutral party there. Let's get an official. Normally, it's a retired official or you know or an official's wife, honestly, because you know it's a simple you know it's a class. You don't have to be a former official to do it, and let them do it that way. No, it's not a teacher doing it. It's not definitely. I don't know if I'd put a parent at the clock. I just, I don't know. I might yeah. put a parent of a, I might put a girl's parent of the boys game, a boys parent of the girls game. But again, you know, I would, I was going to pay a vol- volunteer, not, they wouldn't be volunteer. I was going to pay them like 25 bucks a game, but I think it's 36 50 by going through the officials. So it's 73 bucks a night more, you know, not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, they don't make us do it for JV games. Nice. Oh, that, yeah, so that's I don't think they. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I mean, they, so. I don't know if they will next year or not, because this year was, you know, kind of the first year to next year. This, this year was optional for certain regions and games. We voted on. We voted to do it. Um, but you know, some older gyms can have some issues installing the clock. I mean, a lot of the new gyms have it, but like older gyms with older wiring and way things are set up, like you know, it's something you want to definitely do months and months out, and it's going to run you. You know, I'd say an easy three to four thousand dollars to do that. Yeah, those are all all good points and things to think about. I think what what the SPC is going to do is have officials then bring basically a fourth person. Yeah, I really like that idea of having it almost be a part of the officiating crew rather than like you said, the the worst thing ever with Booker Clock is late game issues that make your team look good (laughs) or help your team. You don't want that. Yeah, you know, the the restarting on an air ball, just little things like yep. that. And there's going to be some – there's two or three games where we didn't get to use the clock because there was a clock malfunction. Just little little yeah. troubleshooting things that you, you've got to think about. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti Podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.